Hello and welcome back to Steam with Steve. Today we're going to go through how floating point numbers work and how they sort of break down um, compared to what integers do. So floating points are a little bit different. They allow you to store decimal numbers, but they only have a certain level of precision. So on, with this particular structure, there's 32 separate bits and it's only accurate to a six decimal point number. So what you'll find is the first bit represents the, if it's positive or negative. The next bit represents the exponent for those scientific notation people. That's the same as 10 to the power of whatever it is. But in this case, it's two to the power of that. And the last bit is the mantissa, which then describes how um, the modulus or how big the number, um, the number representation at the end is. So let's unpackage um, it. So what is a floating point number? Basically, it's changing into scientific notation. So you'll have the normal number, and then the way that it's stored in the computer, it's very similar to scientific notation. So it's stored using binary though. So instead of um, our normal number system, you have to store it in ones and zeros. The floating point is a compression algorithm. So the idea behind it is it allows you to store really big numbers, but in a nice compact way. So once you've done the compression, when you restore it, the number is not exactly the same, but it is accurate to six decimal places. So that's really important to think about when you do this. So why have this standard way? Well, basically in 80, 1984, the IEEE made up the standard so then other people could store decimal numbers. And what they found is pretty much in 32 bits, you could use this little algorithm and it's able to store numbers that are really complex. So the sign bit, like I said, is the first bit, then the exponent is the next eight bits, and then the significant or the modulus at the end that tells you the precision that's in it. So they came up with um, three different ones. They have a 16-bit, a 32-bit, and a 64-bit. So this is what you might have heard as a single, a double, and then a half. The IEEE um, 754 standard is basically precise to 32 bits. It has three parts like we talked about. So it has the sign, the exponent, and then the mantissa. So the sign is the first bit always. So that's the 31st bit. The next eight bits represents the power. So what happens is you have 256 different options there, which is a lot. So you basically can go from 127 down to negative 128, and then you have the mantissa, which is the decimal point afterwards for the next 23 bits. Those 32 bit number, um, so it's also another way of saying it's four bytes, come together to make the floating point number. So a real simple example, if I made this number, so 111, um, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, um, 0, 1. This is exponent, this is mantis at the end. That's the same as negative 1.11001 times 10 to the power of 1101, um, which is the binary version, which gave you that in um, as a floating point number. Note that it's saved in powers of two. So that because it's binary, it's not 10 to the power of the number, it's two to the power of that. Now this, might look a little bit confusing because it's gone from this to this and where's the one one zero and where's this well hopefully you should see some little patterns so the mantissa one one zero zero one is down here and then the exponent even though it's got this it looks somewhat similar if you just look at the back end here so it's got one one zero um one so how do we unpackage that? Let's go through it. So first of all, let's play with the exponent. So why is 127 an important number when we're dealing with this? Well, basically the exponent. So the exponent, we have eight bits to play with, which, sorry, that should say 256. So two to the power of seven is 128. So we're gonna use this as a thing called negative bias, which is what's gonna cover through. And then there's a cool little video here that shows how to do that but I'm gonna go through it here anyway. So the steps that we do it. The first step is we divide the integer part by two until we get to a whole number. So you're left with either a one and a zero and you shift that um, across. You then multiply the decimal part by two until you get a one and a zero, which then gets rid of all the, um, changes the number into a binary form like you can see here. So 11.101101. You then write the full number, then shift the decimal place to the first decimal point. So you just shift it across and you count how many loops that you've done. From that count that becomes the exponent, you add 127, which is the thing called negative bias to that, and then it shifts it across. So there's a really cool tool online, which is this one here. If you type in the different values or click on the different bits, it shows you the IEEE converter. 
So it shows you what that value actually looks like um, in binary, which is pretty cool. So a really simple example, like I said, we had that. You can then also um, write it in terms of um, binary powers with the mantis and so on. So the first step, let's unpackage that, is the sign. So the sign is whether it's positive or negative, that should be pretty obvious, it's just the first one. So if the sign bit represents if the number is positive, if it's zero, and negative if it's a one. In this example, we've set it to negative because the first bit's negative one. The exponent then is the next bit, which is this bit afterwards. So to give the exponent, it can be either negative or positive. So you can have really, really small numbers or really, really big numbers. And the range of this is down to negative 127 all the way up to 128. And basically what happens is 127 is subtracted from that number um, as part of the algorithm. Because if you just have that number, you would only have the numbers from zero up to 255, which isn't gonna give you um, all the options because it's only gonna give you positive numbers. So part of the algorithm that the nerds back in 1984 worked out is by subtracting 127 from that, it shifts it all the way down, but then allows you to store negative numbers without having to store a negative symbol, which is kind of cool. So if we add 127 to 13, we get 140, which is in the binary form of that. So if you subtract it, it's the same, which is kind of cool. So the mantis is the last bit, which is the, um, the bits that are afterwards. And basically that's, that comes from just taking one off the front because if it is a number, if it's zero, this doesn't work. But if it, as soon as it's got a number to the right of it, you've got to include it and that's the standard part, um, which is the mantissa. And then there's a cool little video there if you want to watch it as well. And then there's some special cases that you need to follow. So the special cases with IEEE in the way that you represent it. So programming languages use these special numbers. So basically these are little hacks. If you type this number in as a, um, a floating point number, it just overrides all the different rules that we just did then. So if you put zero and then all ones for the exponent and then all zeros, that is infinity. And then negative infinity, you put a one on the front. If you make them all zeros, become zero. If you make it negative um, zero, you put a one on the front. And then if you wanna make it not a number, you just make it all ones there and it doesn't matter what numbers you put in anywhere else with the X's. So not a number is called a NAN. And basically what happens that is when you do division by zero, square roots of negative numbers, it result, results in the error code that comes back, um, which gives you some feedback that it didn't work. Um, yeah, so the integers and floating point, if you convert it between an integer and a floating point, um, there could be some errors as well. So sometimes you might want to type cast between these different things and chop off the tail, but then it's stored in a different way. So write down a small positive integer number and try and convert it. So there's the smallest um, pos possible floating point number that you can do, which is kind of cool. And now try and do the, the largest, which looks like that. So notice that the code here wasn't one, all ones because that would then override it and make it um, not a number. So you can get some really big positive numbers and really small numbers. When you do a decimal fraction, so for example, 19 divided by three is actually 6.3333333 recurring. And um, floating point numbers can't handle that precision. So the same error occurs when we're running these decimals. <coughs> so one over one third is um, better to write as 1.3333 because that's way more accurate than the one point, just writing as 1.3. So this is what we call precision. So the more decimal points after the decimal place, the more precise it is. Now with the floating point algorithm, it is only accurate to six decimal places, sometimes seven, depends on the number. So you need to be mindful of that with the error conversion. So if you store 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2 um, in your computer and then type it, it will actually give you that as the answer, which is kind of weird. Now, if you think about it, it is accurate to six decimal places. If you come down here to the six decimal place, that is correct. But if you go all the way down, I don't know, to the 19th decimal place, whatever that is, you can see a four. So this is because the way that the, the floating point algorithm works is not accurate once you get past that decimal place. So when we talk about precision, it's only accurate to six to seven decimal points. Um, once you enter seven, anything over that is not gonna work. 1.9, because 
87587658 will not be stored accurately, it will be only stored to the seven decimal place. Um, to fix that, you can add more bytes. So instead of four bytes, you're gonna use um, eight bytes, which gives you a 64-bit number, or also known as a double. And then that can be accurate to 15 to 16 decimal places. Cool. And you can play around with this. So here's a really cool thing. You entered 1.478954. And you can see here that this is the way that the algorithm stores it, right? And then that's the binary representation. And then if you go through, it does still work to six decimal place. It will round it up to the right thing, which is kind of cool. So it starts losing precision once you get past that sixth or seventh decimal point. And the more you play around with that, the easier it will become. So like I said, a double compared to a single, um, they're a little bit different the way the algorithms work. Um, but they do work some pretty neat things. So a double precision can go up to 308 um, exponent power, whereas the single can only go to 10 to the 38. So there's a lot of more precision and a lot bigger numbers that can be stored in a double. Generally for gaming, doubles are a lot, used a lot more because of keeping that precision. So here's a Nessa style question. So the following di diagram shows the single precision floating point representation. Identify three components above and represent the decimal number 26.125 in this notation. So you would go through that process that we just did. And so you would talk about how the sign bit would be the zero at the start, <coughs> change the 26 into integer form, and then 125, um, you'll see that those are the different columns. So the zeros and the ones. And then, um, yeah, basically you go through the sign bit, the exponent, you add on 127 to the exponent to get 131, put in the mantissa, put in the sign bit, and then put the exponent in, and then there you go. Then we've got this little problem here. So Archer writes and then runs the following program. Begin dim big number as a single precision floating point. Big number is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Print big number is, add big number, and it produces that. But what you should see after the seventh decimal point, it's inaccurate. With reference to different components of single precision floating point representation, explain the similarities and differences between Archer's value for big number and the output. How could the accuracy be improved? Well, the components, um, we should have a sing sign bit, the exponent, and then the mantissa. Both coded numbers are displayed a positive, but would have a sign bit of zero. Both would have a coded number and the display would be approximately the same number. However, they differ um, by three. This means the exponent um, of both would be exactly the same. If they were different by one, the exponent would have shifted the number. However, the reason the coded number in the display is different because of the precision, level of precision of a single um, floating point. And the way that you could fix this is by using a double and that would increase the precision. So hopefully that's giving you some insight. And then there's what the marks would be if you did that question. Consider the following 32 bits of number um, data. The data can be represented in many ways, including cat, the integer of that number, and then the floating point that number. With reference to the binary representation of the data, explain how these three representations are possible. There's no need to perform calculations. <coughs> well, there's the answer. So each group of the eight bits or one byte represents an ASCII character for the first one with the first byte specifying the three characters in the string to follow. The bytes represent a single long integer, the first bit possibly being the sign, and then the bytes of the next one is the floating point number with the exponent, the sign bit, and the mantissa. For the single precision floating point representation system IEEE 754 using eight bits for the exponent and 23 bits for the mantissa, a different system called my system using 11 bits for the exponent and then 20 bits for the mantissa. Contrast the numbers that can be represented with the two systems, justify the answers. So pause the video, have a go. So what you should see here, eight bits compared to 11 bits means the exponent's gonna be bigger, which makes a large number, but then the accuracy is gonna be suffer because the mantissa is not as long. So my IEEE has a greater range of value, bigger and smaller, because it has a bigger exponent, but the IEEE has a greater precision because it has a bigger mantissa. The following 32 bits represents a single floating point number with IEEE. Um, the student claims the number has a decimal value between negative two and negative one inclusive. Is the student correct? So then you unpackage it. So the sign bit is one, which means the decimal value is negative. The stored value is an exponent, which is 0111, which is the same as 127. So that the actual exponent is 127 less that, because we use the, the um, 
negative bias shift. So the actual exponent is then set to zero. The number stored then is negative one um, times two to the power of zero. So therefore the student is correct. So that's how you would store it. So there's another cool little video, um, sorry, picture to show you the, the different values. So once you get to negative infinity, infinity, you have these different values. And then you also have zero and negative zero, which um, doesn't work, but it, sometimes the computer will output that. So you need to have a way of storing it. And then there's a cool little video at the end there that you can sort of um, play around with. And yeah, that's pretty much it from me. If there are any questions, please um, put them in the comments down below. Um, don't forget to like and subscribe as it does help with that YouTube algorithm. And yeah, see you next time on Steam with Steve. Adios.